a joy to be here with you. And we really had a good time last night, starting off with Matt and Al And if you weren't here last night and you'd like to join us this afternoon, you are welcome to do so. Gil and I are from Faithful Today Television, the oldest religious television broadcast in the world. In fact, this month we are celebrating 64 years of television broadcast ministry. Um, yeah, we praise the Lord for that. I, I posted that on my Facebook account and someone asked whether or not I was the founder. <laughs> that was just wrong. <laughs> I'm the unfriend somebody. Now. <laughs> but the ministry was founded by William and Virginia Fagel, uh, television pioneers, who wanted to greet broadcast with people who might not go to church and find a way to introduce them to a Jesus who loves them, a Jesus who cares. And so we do that today through our uh, flagship program, Lifestyle Magazine, which is an interview program, uh, interviewing people in the areas of personal relationships, personal finance, and personal health. We're going to rebrand that to actually become Lifestyle Health instead of Lifestyle Magazine. We're, we'll still do Mad About Marriage, but we're going to focus more on health and healthy living. Gail and I are heading three co-hosts to our programs, Lionel Mountain, who is a motivational expert, Obi Obadaki, who is a fitness and training expert. This guy's got 1.6 million Twitter followers. I don't know what that means, but he's got 1.6 million Twitter followers. That's interesting. We're also adding a physician to our um, uh, broadcast team, and that is Dr. Sharmini Long, and she just happens to be here right over here. You know, wave a hand up there, sir. I called her out. There we go. And she's right here in Parker. And she's going to be a part of our broadcast team, joining our, our team on Lifestyle Health. It used to be Lifestyle Magazine, but we're rebranding. You'll see those shows begin to air sometime this fall. And if you don't um, currently catch us on television, go to lifestyle.org, and you can uh, watch anything that's been broadcast there. Just stream it at lifestyle.org. So before we start with our message today, I want to just ask you, who do you trust? I mean, who do you really trust? Who would you trust with your life? Who do you trust? I gotta tell you that my list is small when it really comes down to genuine trust with everything. When it comes to people on this earth, that list gets very, very short and really it starts with my wife, Gail. I trust her implicitly. My children I trust, although, you know, as I get older and they start looking for a nursing home, I'm not sure <laughs> exactly how that trust is gonna work out for me, but. But I do trust Gail completely. I trust her <coughs> implicitly. But you know, after, after that, the list gets very, very short. Who do you trust? And if there's no one on your list, then do you feel all alone? Do you feel rather ragged? Well, we want to talk today about <coughs> trusting someone who even is more trustworthy than your spouse. And someone who says, I'm here for you, and I will never leave you, never forsake you. Yeah. We're going to find this in John chapter 14, but before we look at John 14, we're going to kind of think back to chapter 13. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's told them, I'm going to leave you. He's speaking, of course, of his death and resurrection and ascension. He'll be leaving his public ministry here on earth, beginning a ministry in heaven. Um, so he says, I'm leaving you. And they're not really sure exactly what all this means yet. I mean, he's been telling them all this time, but they had a different picture of what the Messiah was supposed to be like. So this is not really registering with them exactly what it means that he's leaving. And it makes them nervous because they still want him to be an earthly king, but that's not in Jesus' plans. And so when he said, I'm leaving you, I'm going to go away now, they start asking questions. It's like children when their parents get up to leave and leaving them with a babysitter or someone, and they start asking questions. Oh, where are you going? When are you coming back? Can we go with you? And those are the same questions that the disciples were asking. Jesus says, I'm leaving now. And, and like children, they're asking the very same questions. Where, where are you going? Can we come? When are you coming back? When will we see you again? It's an answer to those questions that Jesus gives us, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. And these are passages that if you've been in the church long, or if you've been a Christian long, you can probably um, cite by memory. But let's take a look at this and unpack this just a little bit to see really what this is talking about. John 14, verses 1 through 3. Start off with verse, verse, verse 1. Do not let your heart be troubled. In fact, let's just stop right there. When he, they're saying, where are you going? Can we come? When are you coming back? He says, don't worry about this. 
Don't let your heart be troubled. This is really a, a uh, cousin com uh, or companion passage to the most frequently repeated negative command of Scripture. You know what that is? Fear not. That is the negative command given to you in Scripture more often than any other negative command, more often than thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. That, you know, more often than anything is fear not. Don't be afraid. In fact, it is listed 365 times in Scripture, one for every day of the year. If you want to know what it is that God does not want you to do more than anything else, the one thing He does not want you to do as a believer is to be afraid. Fear not. Christianity should not produce fear. In fact, if you go to a religious meeting and the speaker, well-intentioned though he may be, speaks in such a way that it produces fear in your heart, what you've experienced is not the Spirit of God. Just pure and simple. It's not God. It's not His Holy Spirit. Because Jesus says to His, his followers, I have not given you a spirit of fear. He does not want you to be afraid. You know, we live in tumultuous times. This is a crazy world we live in. You watch the news, you'll get depressed, and you'll become anxious. You'll become fearful. But God's word to you is fear not. And Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. Well, that's one thing to say. But what's going to keep me from being troubled? What's going to keep me from experiencing fear? He goes on with the rest of the passage. Believe in God... Believe also in me. The word believe is big in the Gospel of John. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. Believe in me. Uh, uh, Jesus says, um, For God so loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son into the world, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Belief is linked with eternity. Belief is linked with Forgiveness of sins and salvation in Jesus Christ. Belief. But the word belief, as we use it, sometimes it just refers to a, a, a mental assent to a set of facts. All right, I believe this to be true. But no real emotional state. Well, that's not the original word. The original word implies a relationship. And it implies something deeper than just, I believe this to be true. It, belong, it, it really could be translated trust. Trust in God. You trust in God. Trust also in me. And it implies a relationship. I trust Gail because I know her. I trust Gail because I've seen her. And I've seen how she reacts to the positives and the negatives of life's, the life's trials. I know how she reacts when I fail. And how she reacts when, when I succeed in something. She's always there. I trust her because I know from experience what she's going to do. This is exactly what Jesus is saying. Know me. Experience me day by day and build a trust in me. And that trust will take away your fear. Every time you feel fearful, you just simply think back to the one you trust. He's always there. He's always going to be there. And you can rely on him. That's what this is talking about. He said, you trust God, trust me. Yes, I'm going away, and I know you're anxious about that, but don't let your heart be troubled. You trust God, you can trust me. You can trust me. That's his answer to you when fear strikes you. He said, trust me. Now, trusting him doesn't mean that everything's going to turn out exactly as you want it to. It means that when even the worst thing hits, he will see you through it. He will carry you through it. He will get you through it. Trust Him. He'll get you through to the other side. Trust me, is what He's saying. I love that. So, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe or trust in God. Trust also in me. And now He changes the language just a little bit in verse 2. Because He uses the language of the bridegroom. Now, before we read verses 2 and 3, let's set the scene just a little bit. The disciples caught the drift of this, I think, because he used language that they would understand from the language of the bridegroom. Here's how it happened and how you got married in Jesus' day. Marriages were arranged, and so you or your father would arrange for you to marry an individual if you're a young man. Uh, they would arrange for this. Maybe you'd go to the, the father of the bride-to-be, who, who you hoped would be the bride-to-be, and you'd discuss, you know, I think it's an appropriate thing for my son uh, to marry your daughter. And um, if they were in agreement, then you would talk about a dowry, and a price would be paid 
for the promise of eventually marrying your daughter. And so perhaps the young groom-to-be would, would fork over this money to his dad and he would pay it to reserve this girl for his, his son. And once the agreement was made and the dowry was paid, that couple was considered to be married, although she would continue to live with her father until the day of the ceremony. It was more than an engagement, it was a betrothal, and that meant that it was legally binding in some respect, but they would not live together as husband and wife, and would not do so until the wedding ceremony itself. Once that was done, once the betrothal was made, and the dowry was paid, the son would go back to the father's house. He left the bride to go back to the father's house, and he made preparations. The first thing he did, since this was an agrarian society, is he knew that he would live on the, fa the farm with his father and his mother and his extended family. And he would, he would have his wife there, and so he would build an extension onto his father's house. He would build an apartment, as it were, onto the father's house. <coughs> and so that was the first job. Before he could get married, he had to complete that apartment. And he would plan it out, he drew it in the dirt there, and then he would start, he'd start the process of building it. Once that was complete, he's still not ready to get married because you've got the wedding feast to prepare for. Now that was a little more difficult task in those days because you had to wait until fruits and vegetables were in season. You had to get a calf fattened up at just the right time, just the right age, you know, in order to make this thing work. And so a lot of planning. And two invitations were sent out for a wedding. The first was, I'm starting to prepare a feast. As soon as I get it together, a second invitation is going to come out because there's no refrigeration. Once I got the stuff ready, you better come eat it quickly. That's basically what, what this was about. So there will be a first invitation saying, clear your calendars because as, as soon as I get the feast together, we're going to have a wedding party. And then when everything was together, quickly the next amount announcement went out and everybody came to enjoy the wedding feast. And then when they were all there, the groom would go to the, the house of the, the bride, her father's house, and collect his bride and bring her back to his father's house for the ceremony and where they would live together. That's what was done. It's with that in mind that Jesus says this. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. He says, I'm about to pay the dowry. What was the dowry? His life, his blood. He paid an ultimate price for his bride to be, you and me. Referred to in scripture as the church. That's the body of believers who accept Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. I'm, I'm about to pay the dowry, and it's a big dowry. And after I pay that, I'm going to my father's house to prepare a place for you. There's going to be a lot of apartments on my father's house. And I'm going to prepare for you. But this little phrase here, if it were not so, I would have told you. That was a, a, a Jewish idiom. It meant kind of like, well, my word is my bond. Um, it, it, it was a, a little figure of speech which just said, you can trust me. You can trust that I will do what I say. My word is my bond. Uh, I wouldn't have told you this if it wasn't true. That's basically what he's saying. You can trust me. I'm not going to steer you wrong here. If I tell you something, I'm going to do it. If I've made an agreement with you, I'm going to see it through. That's what he's saying. So every word is a word of assurance, a word of hope, a word that is building trust. You can trust me to do what I've said I will do. I'm going to go to my father's house. I'm going to pay the dowry so that we are legally bind, bound together. And if I pay that dowry, I'm going to go to my father's house and prepare a place for you so that I can come back and get you. Now, by the way, if Jesus paid the dowry for you, and he did that with his own life, his own blood, do you think for one moment he's not going to come back and collect his bride? What kind of a fool would he be to pay that high a price for the bride and not come back and get her? Are you kidding me? You know, Jesus is not stupid. He's not wasteful. When he pays the price, he's coming back to get you. And that's exactly what he says here. In my father's house are many dwelling places. Many apartments would be another way of saying this. Uh, some, some translations say mansions. But really it's referring to an extension onto an existing home. Many apartments would be a good way to translate it. If it were not so, I would have told you, you can trust me. My word is my bond. 
For I go to prepare a place for you. And verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, just as the groom would go receive the bride for himself, that where I am, there you may be also. Wherever I am, you're going to be there. We're never going to be apart again. I'm coming to get you so that there will never be a goodbye, never be a parting. We will be together forever. Are you anxious? Jesus has an antidote. It's trusting in Him. You look at the stock market and it makes you anxious. You look at the employment picture, it makes you anxious. You look at the news, it makes you anxious. You look at the national debt, it makes you anxious. Jesus has a solution for you. Trust me. This isn't your home. I've paid a dowry for you. I've made a commitment through my blood to you. A commitment, a covenant, a promise. And I'm going to fulfill that ultimately because I'm coming back for you. I'm preparing a place for you where you and I can be together forever. And because I've paid the dowry, I'm coming to get you. You can trust me because eventually all this nonsense is going to be over and it's going to be nothing but sweetness. That's his promise to you. And that's the antidote for your worry, for your anxiety. You know, when I think about this story, I think about a couple that I met years ago. I worked for a time as a hospice chaplain, and hospice is an organization devoted to those who are terminally ill. And so I was a chaplain for that organization. It was my job to visit everyone on the program and then to follow families afterward, after the death of the loved one, so that they would have support in their grieving process afterwards. Uh, and a woman came on our program, her name was Ruby. Her husband, uh, and she had been married for 67 years. 67, that's marvelous, isn't it? I met a couple here last night at our seminar, they've been married 62 years, they said. Uh, another five years, you'll match Ruby and Roy, is their names. Ruby and Roy had been married for 67 years. They'd been high school sweethearts. But... Roy was not about to ask Ruby to marry him until he had everything ready. He felt it was right to take care of her properly. And although no formal agreement was made, Ruby knew what was going on and she knew that he would ask her eventually. And so she turned down all other suitors as she waited. And she waited some time because Roy went to college and he went to graduate school. He got a job, saved money and bought a house. And then when he was 27 years old, he married Ruby. So from high school until he was 27, now you can do the math. He was 27 when he married Ruby. They'd been married for 67 years. Roy was now 94 years of age, and Ruby was not far behind. And they had been married that long. During those 67 years of marriage, they had never spent a night apart from each other. Can you imagine that? <laughs> never spent a night apart. And theirs was such a sweetheart romance. Their children, some of whom were by now retired, um, you know, said they could never remember mom and dad fighting. They're sure they must have had disagreements, but they never saw that. They were just always sweethearts. 67 years of marriage. Well, Ruby was dying. She was dying of cancer. And there was nothing that anyone could do. And Ruby was not afraid to die, but she was afraid of dying alone. She just wanted someone there with her when that time came. She said, I'm okay with this, but I'd like someone to be there with me. And so when the hospice nurses came in one day and they said, you know, we think tonight's the night. She's starting to have some pain we can't control. They called in the family. And the family pledged they would sit up with Ruby all night long so that someone would be by her side at all times. They brought in a hospital bed because they thought maybe she would be more comfortable there. And they put the hospital bed in the living room. And they put Ruby in the hospital bed. And so everyone was to go to bed. And one of the sons was going to take the first watch sitting up with mom. So that Ruby would not be alone when she died. Everyone went to bed. Roy went to bed without Ruby. After 67 years of sleeping in the same bed with that, with that woman, having never spent a night apart from her, do you think Roy could go to sleep? Are you kidding me? That bed was huge. It was empty. 
he tossed, he turned, he, he did everything he could to go to sleep and it just was not working. So finally he gave up. He put on his trousers, got his walker and walked into the living room where his son was and said, you might as well go to bed. I can't sleep anyway. And he sat down next to his wife, that chair by her bed, picked up the remote, turned on television and started to look at things. But he said, I couldn't find anything worth watching. Apparently Lifestyle Magazine wasn't on. <laughs> Don't think I can figure and he said, you know, I felt impressed I was to turn off the television. Felt impressed. So he turned it off. And he stood up next to Ruby's bed. And he looked down at the face of that sweet, dear woman. The woman he loved so, so much. The woman he had spent so much of his life with. He looked down at that sweet, angelic woman. And he just reached down and took her hand in his hand and squeezed it. And Ruby opened her eyes. She smiled at her husband. She closed her eyes and she died. Just like that. Roy's standing there holding his wife's hand. I talked to Roy later and Roy said, I feel so guilty about that. I said, guilty. I understand loss and sorrow and, and, and maybe even anger over losing your wife, but, but guilt. Talk to me about that. Why guilty? He said, after 67 years, I should have done something at that moment. I should have said something. There should have been something more than just standing there like a dummy when she died. I said, maybe. Maybe there's another way of looking at it, Roy. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, 67 years ago when you got married, where were you? We were in Cleburne, Texas. Whereabouts? First Christian Church. What were you doing? You were standing in front. What else were you doing? Listening to the preacher. What else were you doing? Sweating profusely. <laughs> what else were you doing? Uh, we were holding hands. I said, you were what? We were holding hands. I said, 67 years later, when Ruby left the marriage through death, what were you doing? Holding hands. I said, Roy, Ruby left the same way she came in. Do you think for one moment she would have had it any other way? He said, I never thought of that. I guess not. I continued to visit Roy as the weeks went by. And one day as, as I was trying to help him through his grief, I, I asked him a question. I said, all right, Roy. 67 years with Ruby. Any regrets? He thought just for a moment and said, yeah, I've got one regret. All right, 67 years and one regret, that's not bad. <laughs> I know some people will get past 67 minutes without a regret, all right? So 67 years and one regret, not too bad. This, I've got to hear now. If there's only one regret after 67 years, I want to know what it is. I'm sorry, but I'm nosy. And that's, you know, preachers do this. We ask questions. So... What's your regret, boy? I always thought we would have more time together. Are you kidding me? 67 years of marriage, the last nearly 30 years of which they've been together almost 24-7 and never spent a night apart. And the one thing Roy wanted more than anything else was more time with Ruby. First of all, that's the marriage I want. But secondly, and maybe more importantly, you understand that how Roy felt about Ruby is how Jesus feels about you. Seriously. Only you take Roy's feelings of love and longing and you multiply it by a billion and you just scratch the surface of how Jesus feels about you. The one thing he wants is more time with you. And as I, as I look at my life, I think, are you kidding me? You got everything in the universe at your disposal and you want this? And he says, yeah. I got a question. Your taste, Lord, but okay. 
He says, that's the one thing I want. One author has written, heaven is the presence of Jesus. In other words, wherever you are with Jesus, that's heaven. But I've got a better one, I think, today. And that is this. For Jesus, heaven is your presence. It won't be heaven without you. That's why he's gone to great lengths to make sure that you can be there. He's giving it to you as a gift. He said, all you've got to do is trust me. Enter into a relationship with me. Trust me. I'll change you. I'll make you the man, the woman you never dreamed you could ever be. I will do that because you can't do it. I will redeem you. I will forgive you. I will save you. And I paid the dowry for you. And I'm coming back to you. I'm preparing a place for you. It's a place you're going to love. Trust me. I know your taste. It's really it's something you're going to adore. And I'm coming back to get you. And when I do... I'm going to receive you to myself and we will never be apart again. Throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, you and I will be together. No goodbyes, no partings, no sorrows, no more anxiety, no worry, no sickness, no death. It's all gone. We will live happily ever after. No goodbyes. Jesus loves you a couple billion times more than Roy loved Ruby. And he's coming for you. And folks, you can trust that. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, today we want to trust you. We have our doubts, we have our fears, our misgivings, but today, Lord, we long to trust you. So today we enter into that little relationship just saying day by day let us see the evidence of that. Your love, your your leadership, your guidance in our lives. Let us see it. Let us experience it. And help us to take that leap of faith and day by day trust you more. We look forward to the day when we will never be apart again. And we claim that day now for we do it in your name. 